Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kat Anderson, and I am the director of the Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity. Under the Board on Population Health and Public Health Practice at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I want to introduce today's moderators, Dr. Octavio Martinez and Dr. Melissa Simon. Both are members of the Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity. Um, Dr. Martinez, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Kat. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on COVID-19 vaccines, leveraging historical successes and failures for equity-centered approaches. We are in the midst of an unprecedented public health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. States and communities are reporting that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting people of color in the United States. The Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity is developing a series of short webinars to focus on critical issues related to COVID and health equity. This webinar is the third in the series of webinars. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and the archive video will be available at the link provided at the end of the webinar today. As our country continues the process of vaccination against COVID-19, we are quickly reaching the point where available vaccines outnumber individuals who want to be vaccinated. As of last Monday, 152 million Americans have received at least one dose of the vaccine, which is about 57% of the eligible population. But what about those individuals who are currently unvaccinated? Vaccine hesitancy has gotten a lot of attention, particularly when discussing strategies to vaccinate individuals of color. The process of vaccination is not new. We have many decades of experience with a number of different vaccinations. For example, the flu vaccine, the polio vaccine, and the H1N1 vaccine. So why not look to these past vaccination efforts to see what can be learned? What are the successes and the failures of previous efforts to vaccinate large numbers of people of color? Let me now turn over to my co-moderator, Dr. Melissa Simon. Thank you so much, Octavio. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that actually as of yesterday, the vaccine pool now has expanded to 12 year olds and up with the recommendation from the CDC ACIP and the emergency use authorization from the FDA. So that adds an extra layer of um, complexity to our vaccine rollout. Um, I would like to now introduce our five rock star panelists here with us today. And we thank each and every one of them for taking time out of their very busy schedules. Dr. Jacinda Abdul Mutakabir is currently an assistant professor at Loma Linda School of Pharmacy in Loma Linda, California. She completed her doctorate in pharmacy at the University of St. Joseph School of Pharmacy an accelerated three-year pharmacy program located in Hartford, Connecticut. Following pharmacy school, she completed her pharmacy residency at the Howard University Hospital in Washington, DC. And she also completed an infectious disease pharmacokinetics, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics research fellowship. And her primary research interests include translating her, translating her in vitro research, focusing on multidrug resistant bacteria to improve patient treatment strategies. She was the 2017 recipient, recipient of the United States Public Health Services Outstanding Service Award and was recognized by the European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease as one of their 30 under 30 outstanding young scientists. Dr. Marina Del Rios is the Director of so Social Emergency Medicine and Tenured Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, the College of Medicine. She has close to 10 years of experience conducting research in resuscitation science, population health and health disparities. Dr. Del Rios volunteers for multiple health and community service agencies and is a member of the Illinois Department of Public Health COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, the Restore Illinois Health Justice Work Group, and the Provider Network of City of Chicago's Racial Equity Rapid Response Team. Dr. Del Rios also serves as the chair of the Health and Policy Committee of Illinois Unidos, and I'm very proud to be a part of her committee and that, and that 
um, organization. It is a cross-sectoral partnership of elected and appointed officials, health professionals, and leaders of community-based organizations that aims to stop the transmission of COVID-19 and address the pandemic's devastating public health and economic impact in Latinx communities, especially focused across Illinois. The, um, Chuck, Mr. Chuck Sams is um, Cayuse Walla Walla Cocopa and Yang Tan Su. He grew up in the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Northeast Oregon. He currently serves on the Northwest Power and Conservation Council as a council member. Chuck has worked in the nonprofit natural resource and co conservation management field and tribal government for over 25 years. His previous positions include several positions in the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Indian Country Conservancy, Conservancy the Umatilla Tribal Community Foundation, and the Tribal and Native Lands Program for the Trust for Public Land. In addition, Chuck serves on the boards of the Oregon Cultural Trust and Gray Family Foundation and holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Concordia University and a Master of Legal Studies in Indigenous Peoples Law and Federal Indian Law from the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Antonio Tovar has worked on social and environmental justice and agriculture since 2005 when he joined the research team of the Farm Worker Association of Florida, an organization he directed from 2017 to 2020. Dr. Tovar was born in Mexico City and completed his BA degree in philosophy at the University of Guanajuato. He also worked as a journalist covering Central America and the Caribbean. Dr. Tovar completed his PhD in anthropology at the University of Florida and has over 30 publications concerning farm workers' health and safety. He is a fellow of the RWJF um, since 2019 and is looking at the mental health of Hispanic and Haitian farm workers in South Florida. This year, he began work at the National Family Farm Coalition in Washington, DC as a policy associate while also maintaining some research in Florida. Dr. Ann Zink is Alaska's chief medical officer and a practicing emergency room physician. She helped create the high utiliz utilizer Matsu program that aims to improve patient health and cost savings for some of the state's most vulnerable patients. Her priorities as CMO include building stronger partnerships between the Department of Health and Social Services, <laughs> excuse me, and Alaska's healthcare providers while providing support statewide in locally relevant ways to help establish healthier communities across Alaska. Dr. Zink received her medical degree from Stanford and completed her residency at the University of Utah. So this webinar will include the series of questions to our panelists. And the first set of questions will be for each of the panelists in turn. Then there will be questions that any and all panelists can choose to answer. And finally, we will take audience questions at the end. Before we begin with our questions, I encourage audience members to ask the panel questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will have time for audience questions at the end of the webinar. So Octavio, do you wanna go for it? Thank you, Melissa. So we have a great uh, panel of speakers here. So let's get started. Um, so this question is for Mr. Sams. Uh, Mr. Sams, how is the enduring context of systemic racism and the marginalization of vulnerable communities historically affected the current moment of the COVID-19 vaccination, especially for indigenous groups? Mr. Sams. Good afternoon, my friends and relatives. Uh, my name is Chuck Sams. My Indian name is Mockingbird with Big Heart. Uh, I come from the place of the Big Springs in Northeast Oregon on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And it really is a, a great honor to be with such luminaries and healthcare professionals. Um, and for those of you out there maybe asking, you know, how did I get here? I'm trying to figure that out myself. Uh, but to be honest, it's uh, my job. Um, my most recent job was serving as the executive director for the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation, where I also served as its incident commander for COVID-19 from March from March to March uh, of from 2020 to 2021. And Octavio, your question is one that um, 
among my people and in my culture, we like to start with the specific and then go to the general. Uh, I know Western education takes us from the general to the specific, uh, but among my education, it was to learn uh, very something very particular in order to understand the fuller context within uh, relationships in, in the general public. And to that end, I'm going to share a short uh, presentation with folks. Are you seeing a flag? Okay, great. I want to make sure. Thank you. So oh, you do still have to make that swap though, swap oh. presenter view and slideshow. Yep, perfect. Looks great. great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is the Confederate Tribes Umatilla Indian Reservations, uh, their traditional tri or their tribal flag. Uh, we're based on a treaty of 1855 with the United States government. We're located in what is presently day known as Northeast Oregon and Southwest, uh, Southeast Washington. Um, but you can see from this where our traditional use areas. So we had roaming in what would be now known as Montana, Wyoming, uh, Southern Idaho, Nevada, Northern California, and uh, Southern Canadian provinces. Um, we had far ranging uh, activities that took us into these traditional use areas to hunt, gather, and fish and for trade. And so, um, we had a lot of commonalities with a other number of other tribes throughout the Pacific Northwest and the Central Western United States, what's now the Central Western United States, in, um, you know, uh, kinship relationships. Um, so we were ended up with exposure mostly, though, to other people uh, beyond American Indians uh, and the Native and Indigenous peoples of North America because of the Oregon Trail and Manifest Destiny. As you can see from the Oregon Trail, it came right through our territory. So starting in around 1760 through 1860, 1760 would mark the beginning of Europeans coming into uh, what would be known as the Oregon Territory, uh, mostly Spanish and some English, uh, and surprisingly some Russian. Uh, and we began to see uh, disease hit our territory in the Columbia Plateau, predominantly measles, but also smallpox. And we ended up with several waves of these diseases coming through between 1760 to 1860. And the, the diseases ended up affecting us in a very significant way. In that 100 year time period, we saw nearly 95% of our population decimated because of disease. We had no immune system to that. And as the diseases were being brought out because of the uh, pioneering spirit of folks wanting to settle on, into our territory, uh, it had a devastating effect. What most folks don't know is that um, most Indians in the West did not die at the hands of guns, but we died at the hands of disease. Um, and that is also true of those on the Oregon Trail. There's a myth out there that um, for those of us who grew up watching Sunday afternoon movies of cowboys and Indians, that you saw uh, Indians attacking uh, settlers all the time. On the Oregon Trail, there were over 30,000 people out of the 300,000 people that went across it that died of disease and uh, other accidents. Only about 500 people were actually were killed according to military records by Indians uh, on the Oregon Trail. And so the vast majority of folks also died from dysentery and other types and forms of diseases that they were bringing out West. And of course that affected most of the American Indians as they were coming out to the West. In the particular, uh, the Umatilla tribe, as I said, is located in Northeast Oregon. Uh, the Aboriginal tidal lands of the tribe are about 6.5 million acres that we ceded and granted the United States. And in return, we reserved for ourselves about a 500,000 acre reservation, which today is about a 250,000 acre reservation. Uh, our current tribal membership includes about a little over 3,100 tribal members. 30% of them are under the age of 18 and 15% of our, our folks are over the age of 55. Half of our tribal membership lives on or near the reservation, uh, about 1,600 folks, and the other half live or are scattered throughout the United States. Uh, we have tribal members in New York and Wisconsin um, going to school and, and living. Um, in addition, on to the reservation, we have another about 1,500 non-Indians. So on the reservation proper, we have a little over 3,000 people that um, live on and work within the reservation. Our workforce uh, is predominantly a 60-40 split, uh, 60 over 60, well actually over 60% of our workforce is non-Indian, uh, meaning non-tribal uh, non members. Uh, only 26% of our workforce is tribal members. So that gives us about 1,724 people we uh, employ annually at a budget of about 360 million people. 
when COVID hit, um, it was, uh, we were one of the first tribes in the United States to experience this. And it wasn't a tribal member. It was actually an employee of one of our enterprises who contracted COVID uh, in March of 2020. I was very fortunate that um, our emergency operating plan shifted from a decision-making power from the elected tribal government and placed it in the hands of professionals. It was at that time that I was appointed as the incident commander and I formed a team that uh, predominantly came from our tribal Indian Health Services Clinic and from uh, different forms of the tribal government who I knew could react quickly and could move logistics and figure out how best to protect our population. And the decision very early on for us was to use the best science, 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 uh, science available, but more importantly, to use data points. And as you can see, this is uh, this last week's CTR's COVID-19 cases. Uh, we used the weekly case count along with test counts, um, and we were very fortunate to work hard early on to get uh, access to testing equipment through the federal government. Uh, while there was a lot of disparity in long, throughout Indian country in this, uh, I think because we, well, I know, because we had a very comprehensive uh, emergency operating plan uh, that we were able to um, demonstrate to federal authorities very quickly that our need, our desperate need in order to ensure the safety of our people. And because of that, we were able to keep our infection rates significantly low uh, in comparison to other tribes around the United States. Uh, our rates of tribal membership were under 10% of our tribal membership um, received, got COVID-19, um, whereas we were seeing uh, upwards of 40, 50% of tribal membership. Uh, our cousins on the Columbia Plateau to include the Yakima Nation, the Nez Perce tribe, the Warm Springs people uh, had significant amount of deaths related to COVID, uh, double digit numbers, and in some cases, triple digit numbers. Uh, granted, some of those tribes are a little larger than us. We um, suffered one death due to COVID related, uh, a, a longstanding cousin of mine, which was very sad to see him go. Um, but, you know, we were able to use the experience that we had learned, both from the flu of 1918, 1919, that also came through our territory, but more importantly, the stories of who survived from the mass uh, epidemics that we suffered between 1760 to 1860. And what we noticed, uh, based on oral stories and some written documentation, it was those who isolated that were the survivors. And so as I remind my own children, it wasn't because they were the smartest, the bravest, or had the best genetics. It was because they took advantage of moving away from the larger villages and um, quarantined themselves in order to survive through these epidemics that hit our territory. And so to that end, we use that as the primary messaging very early on to ensure that the tribal membership stayed home and stayed safe. In addition to ensuring that every house had a uh, number amount of PPE equipment in order to protect themselves and preserve um, their, their homes uh, in a safe and effective way. When it came time for vaccination, we had developed a plan starting in October, and we worked directly. We had an opportunity either to receive vaccination shipments through the state of Oregon or directly through Indian Health Services. Uh, of the nine tribes of Oregon, there were three of us that decided that we would actually go through Indian Health Services. We felt that the obligation of the United States under the Treaty of 1855, which under Article 2 says that they will provide medical supplies and support, uh, was critical for us to uh, ensure that the federal government actually delivered those directly to us. So, well before the Umatilla County, which we lived in, uh, received their vaccination, we started vaccinating people on December 19th on the Umatilla Indian Reservation with the goal of ensuring not only the tribal membership that we got to herd immunity, but then we moved on to phases to include uh, all of our tribal employees who are non-Indian, then all of our tribal employees and their families who were non-Indian. Uh, our goal then moved beyond that to include every non-Indian that lived within the exterior boundaries of the Umatilla Indian Reservation and anybody that had a commercial interest or governmental partnership interest in working with the tribes. So we were able to uh, hold mass vaccination events at our Wild Horse Resort and Casino in which we were able to vaccinate uh, hundreds of people in days 
Uh, we work very closely with the Oregon National Guard, um, which was one of the first times in the 200 years that we actually invited the Army back onto the reservation um, since uh, we were pushed onto the reservation. The National Guard was very effective in helping us streamline the operations in order to get folks vaccinated quickly and effectively. And uh, we're very thankful to Governor Brown uh, and the National Guardsmen who showed up and have continued to show up. Most recently, the wave we are experiencing now, which is why we are also happy to hear the 12 to 17 year olds is, the, is that time frame. We're actually um, in the last week have 18 positive cases with the majority of those of children between the ages of four and 17. Uh, we've had to quarantine the entire 17 member of the freshman class of the high school's reservation kids uh, because they have an infection within that one class uh, of students. And we are moving to a vaccinate 12 and over uh, with a vaccination event that will take place on Saturday uh, of this week. And so um, we're worried and very concerned that there may be a mutation happening. We don't know. We're working closely with Indian Health Services, the CDC, and the state's Oregon Health Authority in trying to figure this out so that we can stem any further, um, any, any further spread of this into our younger people. Historically, tribes have been uh, affected by by. Uh, epidemics in a very, very negative way, as you can tell. And um, there was a strong concern that we wouldn't get enough vaccination, but we used that history, that very negative history, really to educate the tribal membership on how important it was for them to all be vaccinated, not just the most vulnerable, but everybody who could possibly be vaccinated. And more importantly, because we recognized that the, the disease had come to us from other people, we wanted to also vaccinate our extended community. So that way, anybody doing commercial activities, partnering with with us uh, would feel safe not only coming onto the reservation, but we would feel safe to interact with them. And because of that, um, we have reached 70% herd immunity uh, over a month ago uh, on the reservation and within our community, in addition to being able to protect our economic interests so that we can continue to move forward. I credit our uh, clinic, which we run independently, um, and uh, Lisa Guzman, who is the chief executive officer of our clinic, and her staff have done an excellent job in community health and, and uh, community communications in making that happen. So. Thank you. I hope that kind of gives you a kind of an idea. I know that's not what we've seen across the United States and Indian country. Uh, I pray for my people all over the United States, um, but I know that there are ways and good planning and good exercise and working with health professionals to, to stem the tide. Mr. Sams, thank you so much. What a great way to kick off this panel discussion and give us some insights into using history to inform the present and to get to 70% and probably now greater uh, vaccination of your adult population. I mean, I think that's just really uh, exemplary. Thank you so much. Well, let's move on to now, let's hear from, uh, from Dr. Zink. And I know Dr. Zink, you have some, a few slides yourself. So as we're getting those pulled up for you, uh, let me read your question. How did the 1918 pandemic affect the response to the vaccination? And how has the enduring context of systemic racism and the marginalization of vulnerable communities historically affected the current moment of the COVID-19 vaccination that we're currently experiencing from your viewpoint. Yes, thank you so much for having me on this panel. And many of the things that were just shared with Charles, I think were very reflected in Alaska's response uh, overall. I think there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. These aren't monocultures and mono communities. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize the differences as well as the similarities and what that looks like. As mentioned, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the state of Alaska, and so my job is to really promote the health and well-being of Alaskans across a state that is larger than Montana, Texas, and California combined. We have more coastline in the state than the entire East Coast and West Coast combined, and it's a large, beautiful geographic area. So I thought I would share just a few slides as well. I would also like to just recognize that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Dedina people. It's a beautifully, well-historically preserved land, and I just really want to thank the people who have cared for this land for uh, thousands of years prior to my presence on this land. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my slides here quickly. I actually added a few more while Charles was talking uh, and to just kind of link the whole thing together. So uh, that's why I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my own slides here um, because uh, it's an ever-changing dynamic process, be it PowerPoint presentations and or our response. And so we gotta always continue to be responsive to the needs at hand. 
So here's a picture of Alaska. We actually love this picture. It's on the back of our state uh, employee cards, which I think is fascinating. Uh, but you can see kind of the Lucian chain all the way out there on the west out by California, all the way down to the southeast where our capital is kind of by Florida. Um, I was out recently in Unalaska, which is along that chain out kind of maybe over Arizona right there. If you look at it, you know, it was a three and a half hour flight over water to get there, uh, to get to our capitals only accessible by boat or by airfare. There's no roads and in, in and out of our capital. So this really determines a lot of our geography as well as our response to the pandemic and really felt from the beginning that we could either let geography determine us or if we could be able to use geography to our assets. The reason I'm bringing up geography so much in there, not only does it really, um, is it important in Alaska, but I think it's important in the larger national context. We know that communities that live in rural areas have twice the mortality from trauma. And I think that we need to be talking about the inequities that we see from geography as well as race and ethnicity uh, and being able to be mindful about that as well. And I think that's been really compounded in many of our regions uh, when we have uh, rural populations as well populations that have been marginally uh, served or underserved uh, for years. We are the least densely populated uh, state in Alaska. Many people said, how could you get COVID? Uh, you're least densely populated, but uh, our communities are more like little uh, cruise ships uh, floating in the tundra where we have incredibly densely populated uh, houses uh, and communities uh, surrounded by a lot of space between them. It's not that we all live in our own little bubble uh, out here. You know, rural residents travel 147 miles uh, one way to access care and travel is a key part of our care. Uh, many women who are over 20 weeks pregnant travel into Anchorage to be able to finish their gestation and then and have their child uh, and then move back uh, to areas. So to limit travel and to limit access really limits the ability to provide other access to care and why we have to be thinking about the integrated way. You know, 60% of our communities are only accessed by small plane, 11 by jet, 8% by roads and highways. The marine highway is a critical part. Again, talking about cruise ships, you know, we had a big outbreak uh, on a marine highway uh, ferry and that really limited the ability to get food and water in and out. When COVID first hit, our rural airline system completely collapsed, uh, and that brought people to and from, as well as resources uh, to and from most of our communities, including food and water. Uh, and we had no ability to get to those places without using places like the National Guard. And, and so it just completely collapsed because there wasn't the normal uh, transport that people were doing. You know, as Charles mentioned, there was a lot of history about the fact that communities in the 1918 pandemic that survived were the ones that stood oftentimes by gunpoint and didn't let anyone in and out of their community. And so we saw many communities really stand up and say, listen, we learned from this once. We're not going to have this experience again. We're not having anyone come in and out, but then food wasn't getting in and out. Pregnant women weren't getting in and out. You know, return care wasn't happening because people were not moving. And so how do we balance really that need to prevent the impact of COVID-19, uh, but not also have other health consequences that we were seeing and the limitation of geography and asking people to isolate really impacted that. Here's a picture of our road system. Uh, we have 32 communities that have no running water or sanitation. Um, so it's kind of crazy to me that at uh, this point uh, in America's history, uh, so many of our communities have honey buckets uh, that they uh, go in and that were moved to one place to another. And the discrepancy and the kind of really uh, siloed federal funding and state funding, it seems to make it impossible to get these communities running water and sewer, despite a lot of effort uh, on a state, local, and tribal level to do it. As mentioned, crowded multi-generational houses, you know, 10, 15 people living in a house of multi-generations. Many communities rely on short tugboat uh, for delivery of things like bulk fuel. In fact, during the vaccine process, uh, many of our communities are offering fun raffles. And if you look at them, it really speaks to what are important to communities. Uh, and fuel is a key component of what people are raffling. You know, get vaccinated, get 10 barrels of fuel, uh, because that is what uh, speaks to those communities uh, most uh, readily rather than, you know, a trip trip to Hawaii or something else, or even cash. It's really being able to have access to just basic uh, services like uh, food and fuel. Uh, we have 75 communities in Alaska that lack all law enforcement uh, whatsoever, and most villages lack regular access to police courts and other related services. I think what's been really amazing, however, about the tribal health system is most of our communities have community health aides, which are very much similar to community health workers. And I think that's been a real highlight and success of the tribal health network. And what we've seen is when those community health aides have been engaged in the COVID-19 process, and we've been able to empower them with the tools that they need to be able to fight COVID, they have been phenomenal in being able to do that. You know, one community I can think of with no running water and sewer, their community health aide had one Abbott Now machine. He had someone with sniffles and a runny nose and they tested him, they were positive. He had the tools and knew what to do to contact, trace and isolate. No one was hospitalized, no one died. That, that stopped in its tracks in that community, despite the fact they had no running water and sewer, they lived in large multi-general houses. And so I think when we can really empower communities with the tools, they can really respond uh, in many different ways. I also think we need to not just be looking at numbers, but we're looking at what that needs for the community. 
when the COVID first hit, you know, I was just uh, listening to Charles's comment about testing. We were told in the state of Alaska, you don't have enough people to be able to give tests to like the whole state. <laughs> like you, we need so many positives before we'll give you any sort of additional testing. And we ended up standing up manufacturing 3d swabs ourselves uh, because we were not able to get uh, swabs. So uh, places like uh, New York and California and Texas, the numbers are just always going to be bigger than many of our rural states. And we need to take that into consideration when we think about resource allocation uh, and equity and what that ends up looking like at the back end. Uh, here's another picture. We have 229 federally recognized tribes uh, within the state of Alaska. Um, they uh, have been amazing at being able to figure out uh, how to partner with us and with each other. And they have created kind of these different tribal regions. Uh, and then there's tribal health organizations or THOs, uh, which from a state perspective has made a huge difference in being able to uh, kind of partner instead of having to have 229 uh, conversations, they have a tribal caucus um, and then they're represented by THOs. And so like I sit on the THO meeting every single week where we talk about what's happening with COVID and what's not happening. Uh, and then if there's a question about kind of really, you know, vaccine distribution, what this looks like, uh, it can go to the tribal caucus. It's 100% self-governance. And I think that that has been absolutely critical. And the federal government's uh, really recognition of tribal sovereignty for vaccine was huge. Being able to give vaccines specifically to tribes and what has been kind of tagged the sovereign nation supplement made all the difference in the world for Alaska. All 229 tribes did opt to come with the state to be able to distribute that because we felt like being able to collectively work together, we would be more efficient. Um, but if it hadn't been for that sovereign nation supplement, as well as that continued emphasis on self-governance, uh, I don't think we would have gotten nearly where we were uh, today in the same sort of way. So I, I just wanted to thank the federal government as well as highlight uh, that key decision uh, that was made uh, early on. Well, sorry. I just wanted to pause real quickly on this slide, and I think Charles brought up some of this, but the 1918 pandemic uh, really determined the history of Alaska. Uh, in Dillingham, the hospital is built in the orphanage that was created out of the 1918 pandemic. And the traumatic history that that resulted in, entire cultures were lost, communities were lost, language was lost, the trust in traditional medicine was lost because of that. Uh, and we really quickly uh, early on saw that if we didn't address and recognize that historical trauma, we were not gonna be able to move on and being able to recognize what that looked like. I remember when I was in Dillingham early on in the pandemic and a tribal leader said to me, my grandmother took me to the woods for the year when the 1918 pandemic, it took my mother to the woods for the 1918 pandemic and said, no illness lasts forever. We're gonna go for a year. And when we come back, this too shall have passed. And when they came back to the city of Dillingham, they found that there were kids and dogs and very few adults that were left and had lived through that experience. And he really felt like he had been told the story by his grandmother again and again, so that he could do something different when it hit. And now he was the tribal leader of that community. He's like, I'm not going to allow this to repeat in my history and in my time. But to learn from that experience and then how do you build in a new modern concepts like testing and vaccine into this traditional history? And I'm really hopeful that this uh, recognition of tribal sovereignty and the ability to be able to give vaccines and that self-determination will help to write a different hundred years. Our tribal partners have been amazing in being able to get vaccine out. We have 10 boroughs that are 70% or greater of, of those who are vaccinated uh, at this point, 16 and above vaccinated. We have entire communities that never lost a single person and 100% of those 16 and above are vaccinated. And they have been able to write a different story because of the tools and resources in this pandemic. And I'm hopeful that that will help to undo some of the historic trauma and that recognition and be able to move to a much more healthy and well communities uh, moving forward. I just wanted to highlight the fact that if you don't build in structural equity, then you're only going to get inequity. And so we built in our entire vaccine response team partnerships with tribes. Um, so you can see here's our lead. We had a co-lead from DHSS and an ANTHC, the tribal health uh, consistium lead at every single point. Everything from how do we pay for it to communications to action, there was a tribal lead and a state lead that said at every single step, and I think this was critical. And this happened because of a lot of missteps at the beginning over testing and other supplies. We realize good people can be trying to do good things uh, in the heat of the moment, but if you don't have good visibility and you don't have the right partners at the table, then things don't happen. And this is what happened. We got vaccines out. We were the most vaccinated state in the country for over a month. Um, and really this was because of the tribal leadership. We just got them supplies and resources. I thought of the state as kind of like the Amazon delivery system for uh, the vaccines, uh, but then they really were the communicators, the guides. You can see in that upper right-hand corner, this is when we could only get it to healthcare workers and they would fly to six or seven villages in one day and the, and the community health aides would come up on snow machine, get vaccinated at the runway and then be able to move on to the next site. 
You can see the dog sled there that was pulled from house to house to get those over 75 vaccinated who couldn't get out in the middle of winter uh, to get to different places. You can see that they were starting to do it in the planes because the needles were freezing. Uh, so they had to pivot and <laughs> start to get it in. Uh, but Alaska winters are harsh and uh, they had to be creative and figure it out. And I think honestly, one of my favorite pictures from the whole pandemic is the sweet woman on the bottom left corner. And she said that so many people died during the big, big disease and the big death of the 1918, and that she was so glad that she wasn't going to get sick from the big sickness that was now here. And I think hearing that previous history and the, and just seeing the smile on her face really talks about the fact that we can do this differently and we can write a different history when we're able to provide those voices and we'll be able to partner together and recognize the tribal sovereignty that is there. Communication is key and making sure that we're able to communicate and partner in the ways that we do it. And so we're really uh, continue to do that as we move forward. And so with that, I wanna thank you all for the time to be able to share some of our experiences in Alaska, rural and tribal and uh, happy to always take questions. Thank you. Well, Dr. Thank Zink, thank, oh, sorry, Melissa. <laughs> I was gonna say thank you, Dr. Zink and uh, for those insights. Uh, and yes, let me turn it over to you, Melissa. Thank you, thank you, Octavio, and thank you, Dr. Zink. Dr. Tovar, uh, it has, I think you have some slides that you want to uh, pull up, and while we're doing that, I'm gonna ask you the question. It is challenging to vaccinate those individuals living in the United States who are undocumented. Are there data that indicate they are being vaccinated in lower numbers or at lower rates compared to other population groups? Yeah, thank you, and, and thanks for the honor to be in here with uh, such an amazing group of people. Uh, all the previous presentations were amazing. Um, I uh, To answer your question, it's, it's one of the obvious difficulties of undocumented people is to be counted. So the same way uh, to have a good statistics in terms of how many people undocumented has been vaccinated and who has been not vaccinated is is, is challenge uh, because um, people uh, access to healthcare is one of the of the of the principal um, problems that have people that is undocumented. So there is a few studies that are already published in terms of the disadvantage of people that is undocumented versus the people that is documented. Uh, for, for, for those reasons. Uh, but I, I, will, I will say that um, recently coming from, from the different locations where we are uh, working in Florida, basically all the peninsula of Florida, one of the main problems for the undocumented is that uh, it is very difficult to make appointments. There is not a single policy in terms of the place where they can do the, their appointments. And for sure, the undocumented as, are going to be at the disadvantage uh, for, for getting the vaccine. Now, to, to answer your second question is, when, is uh, why I decided to, to share um, these slides that I, I prepared for uh, another panel. And it was basically talking about the strategies that we have to take to protect farm workers, uh, because um, basically one of the, of the problems uh, that, we, that we have is uh, that in terms of politics, we have to remember that uh, all last year, there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiments in the nation. And Florida in particular, um, two years ago, the legislator actually passed uh, anti-sanctuary law in, in Florida. And we have a very active governor in terms of uh, pushing uh, the buttons of, of anti-immigrants. Uh, I'm so sorry to stop you, but um, we currently see it in presenter view. Would you be able to select at the top of your screen display settings? And then yep, a little higher, display setting. Uh, to the right, to the right. Yep, to Doc, the right. Dr. Tovia, uh, Tovar, in the middle uh, of the, yeah, I, yep. uh -huh. And then swap presenter, yep, perfect. perfect, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Great, thank you. Uh, so some of the strategies, we, we also start very early because uh, we saw that this was going to be um, catastrophic. Um, something that it's 
um, has been a virtue of the Farm Workers Association of Florida is that all our offices, we have our offices in, in the state. And the five offices that we have in the states, they were actually born because uh, natural disasters, hurricanes, freezes. And so we have some experience dealing with uh, disasters. So we saw this like a uh, disaster uh, in the making. So we have to take uh, action because uh, we know that uh, we, for experience, do not receive the support that 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 other agencies or, or, or other population will receive. So many of, of the previous uh, presenters talk about the importance of education. So that's why we start to do education because at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, uh, early March and, and February, there was not promotion of testing or prevention in Spanish or Creole, because we also have a, a large population of, farm, of Haitian farm workers. So we start to create very simple um, material for them and then some videos, because also that's a, a very easy way to, to reach that, that, popul those, that, that population. The other big problem and, and other presenters also mentioned is access to testing. There was very difficult to get tested in, in, in Florida. So we have to rely on other uh, agencies to try to get tested in our places because that's the other, the other problem and something that relate to, to your second question and is about what is effective, what has been good in terms of dealing with this issue. And these are some of the um, groups that we have partnered with in terms of getting the vaccine into our sites and into places. Uh, and the policy of the Florida until really recently was uh, people that was um, over 65, uh, of, uh, 65 years of age. And then a few months later was 50 and then it started to decrease, but that was one of the challenges. Many of the farm workers are younger uh, workers and so they couldn't access uh, the vaccine. Um, the other problem is the hesitancy to get vaccinated. And that's something that we have been working in terms of also uh, producing uh, videos so that people it's more comfortable um, getting vaccinated. But uh, it is, has not been uh, very easy. One of the other challenges that is very common, and um, probably you might hear that, is in terms of the schedule. Farm workers do not have easy access because they have to go to work very early and then they have to, or they return from work late. So scheduling a, a, a time or making a schedule for the, for the vaccine is, is difficult. Uh, finally, I want to talk about the, the differences in, in between the undocumented farm workers and the documented farm workers, because there's a difference. And I know that there is a question uh, at, at the end in terms of the involvement of the, of the um, of the employers. Because what we have seen in Florida is that when the employer get uh, active and try to uh, promote the vaccines, there's there's more people that have access to the vaccines. There have We have been uh, collaborating with the Florida Health Department and with some growers to get the vaccines on the sites of the workers. Uh, and that has made a big difference uh, because um, for some part, the, the growers are telling the workers that they have to be vaccinated. So there is um, less resistance from the workers and also easy access because the growers are paying the time of the workers to go and get vaccinated. So that's a, a, a game changing in this, in this process. And I'm going to stop in there. I appreciate very much your time and I know we are going to have more questions at the end.
Thank you, Dr. Tovar. Um, Dr. De Rios, I know you wanted to address a few points on this in terms of vaccinating uh, undocumented in the U.S. and strategies that appear to be particularly successful with undocumented populations. Yeah, thank you for uh, including me in this discussion, Dr. Simon and, and Dr. Martinez. And, um, and I, I think that I, mostly what I'm going to do is just amplify what, uh, what Antonio just, just mentioned. Um, I think we really need to consider the, um, uh, the structural barriers that our undocumented workers have that go above and beyond the already existing barriers that have to do with racism, socioeconomic status, and so on. Um, and so one of the things that I think that, that um, well-intentioned folks forget is that there is a real reason for mistrust um, among undocumented folks. And so having these large vaccination sites that were sponsored by the government where um, you might have, uh, you know, again, well-intentioned people, but National Guardsmen dressed up providing vaccine. Um, these are the same folks that, that a lot of our undocumented population may uh, completely mistrust because what is that going to mean in terms of my status in this country? And, and are they gonna ask me questions my, about my documentation status and to, and to what, um, uh, Antonio just mentioned, you know, after these four years where immigrants were um, were uh, were labeled as people that were dangerous, that we that we um, that were subhuman, really in in many ways, um, how would you? How is it possible that people would trust um, the same folks that represent that government that have been? Um, you know, so so actively speaking out against uh, uh, immigrant presence and particularly un undocumented immigrants. So what we found is exactly as Antonio said, partnering with um, employers, making vaccines available on site. Um, I think there's also um, ensuring that there's there's trusted messengers in the community, people that are that are advocating. Um, that are known already pre-COVID um, as advocates of the community um, involved in, in this messaging um, and in delivery of, of vaccines. Um, and likewise, um, uh, making places that, for testing for, and for vaccination that are walk-in, that you don't have to worry about providing documentation beforehand to make appointments, but really just being able to walk in and get your tests, get your vaccine. Um, I think those are, are, are strategies that I know can, that we've seen have worked on the ground. Um, and I, I, I'll be able to elaborate a little bit more on that after the next question. Thank you, back to Octavio. Thank you, Melissa. Now we're moving on to uh, Dr. Abdul Mutakabir. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Did I doctor? Okay, good, <laughs> excellent. So um, we've got a very compelling question for you, doctor. According to Johns Hopkins University, people of color along with immigrants and differently abled men and women have endured centuries of their trust being violated. Is it possible to move past this historical racism in this day and time? So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna work very hard to make sure that it is in presenter view. So um, if you all are not seeing it, just let me know or if I'm... Oh, you were and now it went back. <laughs> okay, great, perfect. Okay, there you are. Good. So um, I just wanna go ahead and give you all just a few quick slides, very quick, just to give a description on this. So I do think that it is possible to move past this historical um, mistrust that, that is represented amongst minoritized groups. But I think that it's first and foremost important that we acknowledge that this medical mistrust has existed. So with that, we've developed at um, Loma Linda University, a kind of three-tiered approach at um, kind of mitigating this mistrust and then making sure that we can get vaccinations out. So we begin with what's called a faith summit. And in this faith summit, we include culturally representative individuals for the communities that we wanna vaccinate. So we're focusing on Latino, Latinx, and then, um, African American communities. So we use our vice president of community engagement, Dr. Juan Carlos Belliard, 
and um, he is culturally representative to those individuals. And he really just goes in and he talks about the importance of getting vaccinated, what it means to get vaccinated, how you protect yourselves and the burden of COVID-19 on San Bernardino County in California. Then we have Dr. Bridget Petit. And I think that she's really just our big key here for these for for mitigating this mistrust and this historical context where it comes to the um, vaccination. So she actually goes into the Tuskegee experiment. She discusses sterilization. She she makes sure that she addresses all of these points of medical mistrust and all of these points that may cause some type of hesitancy. But then she talks about what having a spirit or being fearful represents and how the United States and the government has worked very hard to ensure that the mistrust and the, mis the misuse um, and the mistreatment of minoritized groups cannot happen again when we talk about clinical clinical studies in as it, as it pertains to the COVID-19 vaccinations. And then I come in and I um, am their trusted messenger as far as the pharmacology and just how the vaccines work. But I think that our biggest key here has one, we've acknowledged the fact that this, mis that this mistreatment has occurred, but two, we now empower and we now make the individuals of these minoritized communities stakeholders in their education, stakeholders in what it is vaccinations are, and they, they are now aware of these of these processes so they can kind of think about it and we well, we're trusting them to have their own knowledge in regards to these vaccines but then when we give them information on these vaccines we focus we focus really really hard on how these minoritized groups were actually represented in these clinical studies so once again we're reinforcing making them, making them stakeholders not only in just the process of vaccinations but we're making them stakeholders in just how minoritized individuals were represented here in these clinical studies for the covid-19 vaccine so they can know that they were accounted for as um these as we try to find figure out actual treatments and um it, it really is just equitable because now they are now they have the education and the knowledge that everyone else has when they go and they try to make those informed decisions on whether they get um, vaccinated but i also think a really key a really key point to overcoming this historical context is um establishing one i talked about trusted messaging but establishing transparency so in these vaccination clinics that we do have, you see me pictured here in uh, my white coat because I'm actually the lead pharmacist and the lead clinician here at our mobile vaccination site. So these individuals, they know my voice, my voice is distinct. So when they come into these clinics, they say, oh, Dr. Jam is here. So I know that's what they call me, <laughs> Jam. But Dr. Jam is here and I know that um, I can trust that what I'm receiving is exactly, you know, what I heard on these face summits or is exactly what's going was going to be used to make me to make me feel better in, in terms of vaccination so I'm not receiving any type of placebo because of course the Tuskegee experiment is very heavily ingrained in the consciousness especially of the black community and they want to make sure that they're receiving what everyone else is receiving so having someone that's culturally representative and transparent has been shown to be a key in our success with these vaccination clinics. But also when we talk about transparency is even when we have not this breakdown, but when we have news that may not act actually be as positive. Uh, when, so I put in this into context of the Johnson & Johnson pause. When this occurred, I immediately informed um, the individuals that we have been working with um, to get these vaccinations out. I immediately informed them of this Johnson & Johnson pause. We immediately had another vaccination um, webinar or a faith summit. So this is once again just establishing how we've acknowledged that there's been years of mistreatment. We've been empathetic and compassionate about this. And because we have this empathy, because we have this acknowledgement, we now have this have this spirit to be transparent and to inform these individuals of this Johnson & Johnson pause, but to once again make them stakeholders in their education and allow them to have that knowledge to be informed of what this pause means, what this risk represents, and how they should move forward with the vaccination process. So I think that that's important to really just dispelling um, those historical, or not dispelling, but acknowledging the historical myths, but moving forward and really um, just kind of, really just making vaccinations a thing of the present. Um, so not just exclusively with COVID-19 as we move forward with other disease states, making this a practice so that we can vaccinate 
And then also what we do at Loma Linda is we make a low barrier vaccination clinic. So after we give them this information, that's also a part of acknowledging just the historical and the systemic and structural racism that inhibits these minoritized groups from actually getting vaccinated. So once we knock down um, the, once we confront the educational barrier, we then confront the barrier of can they actually make it to these clinics? So we put these clinics in these communities and we do this with the inclusion of faith leaders. And I think that um, Dr. Marina, she did a really great job at explaining that we need to identify individuals that are important in those communities. And for us, especially in the African, African American and Latino Latinx communities, faith leaders are very important to them. They're very important to their decision making. So with that being said, we utilize them as um, individuals that, or they, they wanted to assist us because they're intimately acquainted with COVID-19 and just the turmoil that is caused amongst their communities. They have been so integral to making sure that we've been able to get these vaccines on the ground. So integral in fact, that we did publish a manuscript about our methods for these vaccine clinics. And we included them as authors on our manuscript because that's just how pivotal they've been to our success and how, and how integral they've been to getting their respective communities vaccinated. So of course, does these does the vaccination clinics or our efforts make sense if we have numbers? Likely not. So I just have brief numbers that I want to show you all. And um, here we have our max vaccination clinics at Loma Linda University. And we see that we vaccinated over 17,000 individuals. However, only 579 individuals were Black. This data is from about 2.5 months um, her following the initiation of our mass vaccination clinics. And then we look at our vaccination clinic. This is actually from, excuse me, this is actually from our first vaccination clinic. So this is one day of a vaccine clinic and we were able to vaccinate 351 black individuals. And this was following our education. This was following our inclusion of our faith leaders. And then it was following our low barrier vaccination clinic. And at this low barrier clinic, as Dr. Marina stated, we is actually a walk-in clinic and we use a paper-based registration. So once again, we are confronting that historical, um, the historical barriers um, and we're confronting the structural and systemic racism barriers. And we're making sure that we let in that divide that can be digital divide, transportation divide that we see in, amongst uh, minoritized communities. And we're really trying to bring those vaccines to them. But more importantly, I think that it's important that we acknowledge that there is going to be a difference in barriers. There's going to be a difference in how um, the historical events that have transpired amongst these minoritized groups actually play out and what it is that we need to do to make sure we're continuing to get these groups vaccinated. So I have an example, I have um, just our data here from when we vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine in the black community. We see that we still have a good uh, turnout of Latino or Latinx individuals here. We see that with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, we did have a reduction in the black individuals that we vaccinated, but we still see, we see, we still see we have a heavenly um, amount of Latino and Latinx individuals represented in that vaccination clinic. But then when we move over to our Latino and Latinx community, because we do alternate based upon the location and who we target in these vaccine clinics, when we went to our targeted Latino and Latinx communities, we have 239 Latinx individuals that were vaccinated here. And with Black individuals, we only see five. So where does this put me? This then says, hey, based upon the historical events that have occurred, we have a difference in what, what we need to do to actually get individuals of these different minoritized groups vaccinated. With the Latino and Latinx communities, we kind of put ourselves in that mind frame of, okay, we know that actually placing the access is a, is a big barrier for this community, meaning that they have vaccine deserts, they're actually not able to get to the vaccine. However, in the African-American community, we know that it is going to be important to continue to build these trustworthy, transparent, empathetic, compassionate relationships so that we can continue to get this community vaccinated as well as providing access. So I say all of this to say that while we have this historical, that while we do have the historical events, it's important that we continue to find ways to um, create vaccination access to overcome these barriers and that we build upon and, and that we always circle back and reevaluate these barriers and reevaluate um, our processes for delivering equitable care because it will change for us it's changing <laughs> likely day to day honestly so um yeah this is what we've been doing here to create equity fantastic um 
a great presentation everyone has it and they're really highlighting to me how um, really uh, being in touch with community is such a key component to everything and you know you're your your community engaged when you get a nickname like dr jam so <laughs> thank you dr jam let me turn it over to melissa Thanks, Octavio. So yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Jam. We can indeed move past racism and distrust, acknowledging the maltreatment and distrust that we in the healthcare and science research areas or sectors have earned, but we have to be transparent, open, and honest. And the, the one thing that's coming to mind, and it actually dovetails with one of the audience questions, is this, um, why aren't we trusting communities to know what they need best? what approaches, what tools, what resources, what's gonna work best for them. And, and it blows my mind, why, why is there a reverse distrust where we don't trust, we in the healthcare sector and public health sectors don't trust all the communities to know what they need. Uh, um, so, you know, that's a big question. But in any event, Dr. Del Rios, what strategies are you and your organization uh, using to show that you um, and or your organization are trustworthy so that the community feels it can trust what you and your organizations are saying. So I think that one of the, well, thank you for the question, Dr. Simon. I, I do have a, a quick presentation, but I just wanted to start off with just a few thoughts um, before I just showed um, some of the work that we've been doing. So. Um, so I am the chair of the Health and Policy Committee of Illinois Unidos. And, um, and so I, I wanna share some of our experiences with some of the work that we've been doing in the community to build trust, right? But I think that the, the main message here is um, you really have to start by bringing together a diverse coalition of trusted messengers. Um, and, and trusted messengers, and by, by that I'm meaning people that are already rooted in the community who are known to be community advocates um, and, and we've been involving people that are known advocates from pre-COVID area. So whether um, they're labor organizers, community-based organizations, promotoras de salud, grassroots workers, right? People who are already recognized as community advocates in other realms. Because to the point that um, several of the people in this panel have already brought up, healthcare providers, researchers, and government officials have failed time and time again, communities of color and mistrust and distrust is entirely justifiable. Um, so very quickly, just to share some uh, slides with some of the work that we've done. Um, so let's see if I can put this in presenter mode. Um, okay, just start from the beginning here. So, um, so this goes back to my point that how mistrust is justified. And certainly um, other, other panelists have talked about historical reasons for mistrust. Um, and, and certainly there's enough cases with the, um, the, the US um, sponsored study. And it's very important to note that, that it was a US government sponsored study, the Tuskegee uh, experiment, right? Um, the US sponsored, um, sterilization of Native American, Latino women, people, women in Puerto Rico. Um, so those are historical instances. Then there's the very true COVID infodemic of misinformation um, that was uh, largely uh, promoted even by uh, high levels of government, right? So false information, um, malinformation based, uh, based on fact that was used out of context and disinformation, information that was false and deliberately created to, to, um, to create harm in the communities. And so, um, and so back to um, what uh, the previous panelists just talked about, uh, mistrust and misinformation comes from in all kinds of different flavors and from different places and from different sectors. And, um, and one thing that we've learned is that we need to engage with trusted messengers if we wanna reach the broadest number of people and have the best uh, ability for having um, public health interventions work. And so this is coming straight out of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, um, strategies for public engagement uh, to advocate for, um, uh, to combat mistrust and build COVID-19 vaccine confidence. And, um, and just following this statement, public engagement is critical to overcoming mistrust and building confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. And this is trust for, and this is true for any other vaccines and other, other public health intervention. This engagement is more likely to be impactful in the process 
if it's established and designed so that public values are translated into practice and policy. And these were the six public engagement strategies that are recommended by this academy. Form partnerships, engage and uh, center the voices and perspectives of, of trusted messengers who have roots in the community, engage across multiple accessible channels, uh, begin or continue working towards racial equity, allow and encourage public ownership of COVID-19 vaccination. This goes to what Dr. Simon just said, why can't we trust the public to know how to message and how to, how to deliver interventions and measure and communicate inequities in vaccine distribution, which goes back to the concept of transparency um, that was uh, talked about earlier. So, um, so I guess I get to brag a little bit of some of the work that Illinois Unidos has done. So this was started out as a coalition um, in response to the pandemic. And, um, and it came up because the data on infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates and other clinical outcomes among Latinos were not a central theme in the early COVID narrative. Um, the anti-immigration rhetoric crystallized the biased public narrative, which in turn masked the impact that COVID-19 was having um, and led to an exacerbation of, um, of the devastating realities that were occurring in the Latino community. The urgency of this pandemic um, and the lack of response by policymakers and, um, and many elected officials prompted the development of, a, of an expedited and uh, comprehensive and strategic plan to address the health and socioeconomic needs of Latino communities in Illinois. Um, and in order to confront this pressing situation, this cross-sector partnership known as Illinois Unidos was uh, formed. And um, this cross-sector partnership really engages with folks from all, um, all kinds of different sectors. Um, we're talking about health, social, and economic, um, uh, community-based health, social, and economic um, interventions require a broad sector that includes um, people that are already rooted in the community and that have been doing the work. And so we have people that um, are, are labor organizers that lead our workplace um, uh, task force, right? We have promotoras de salud that help us with think through how to message um, in our community, understanding um, that who truly understand the barriers that our community, uh, that the Latino community in Illinois faces. Um, there's a health policy group that thinks about larger kind of policy level interventions that would help with delivery of um, testing, tracing, and contact tracing, and now uh, vaccines. Um, there's a there's a dedicated COVID literacy group that includes not only healthcare providers um, that work in the front lines, but also um, people that that have been working with community-based organizations for other types of messaging so to, that we can ensure that we're uh, providing information that is easily accessible, language uh, concordant and culturally appropriate. And then thinking outside of the, of the very real health ramifications of COVID, we also have to think about the mental health of our families and also the impact that it's having in our youth. And so there's also an education team that includes um, uh, educators that are from our community that have already been advocating for services in our community pre-COVID who all come together at a table to try to think through strategies and think through perspectives um, to try to combat COVID within our neighborhoods. Um, so going back to the next strategy um, recommended by um, Mason, and it's all about engaging across multiple um, multiple uh, accessible channels and begin and continue working towards racial equity. So much of the work that we've done at Illinois Unidos has been um, increasing Spanish language and culturally appropriate education materials, distributing information through multiple platforms because not everyone is on social media. We need to be on radio. We need to do door-to-door -door canvassing. We need to show up at the bodega, show up where people work, show up where people congregate and where they live and provide information um, that again, and acknowledge uh, the barriers that people have and, and work uh, through opportunities for making um, services available uh, that would be uh, irrespective of access to technology, uh, irrespective of language. Um, and then because of um, our work, we've also been invited 
by media and congressional committees to provide policy recommendations for understanding and addressing the impact of COVID in Latino communities, including we've been invited to become part of a partnership to increase COVID um, vaccine distribution in an equitable manner, manner in the state of Illinois. Um, and we've also, a lot of our, our, of our information has been used and distributed um, by other organizations. Um, uh, because it, it is, again, known to be um, culturally accessible and, uh, and we have it in, in both languages, in English and Spanish. Um, so, uh, the other recommendations allowing and encourage public ownership of COVID-19 vaccination, measuring and communicating inequities in vaccine distribution. Uh, much of what we do, we use data uh, to drive our efforts, right? And so uh, one, one thing that we've been able to accomplish is getting um, that the city at state level more transparency about data on COVID-19 impact and also how COVID vaccination is happening um, at, in, in, our, in our geographies. And we've been able to use that data to then really uh, focus efforts on certain communities, uh, certain neighborhoods to make sure that we have um, the right messaging delivered and also just the actual presence of vaccination sites. Um, and so, um, again, data-driven, um, engaging with, uh, with public health officials and ensuring that we're con constantly communicating with the, with the community about um, where they can get the vaccine uh, in multiple languages, where they can get it without having to make appointments, without having to require um, any documentation. Um, and, you know, I think in the end, it's important to realize that it's hard to trust when all you have from as evidence from the past is why you shouldn't. So, um, so more, most of what we've done is just, again, engaging with people that are already known in the community as trusted messengers um, that, um, that have a legacy in the community as, as true community advocates and really leading, letting them lead the way as opposed to assuming that us, that there's this group of experts that knows how to best do the work. That's right, thank you. Let them lead the way, right? Or let us lead the way, right? You know, us from the community side, not from the doctor side and the research side. Octavio, we're gonna do now the panel back and forth ping pong. <laughs> okay, uh, does that mean we can ask questions now? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So the next set of questions can be answered by anyone on the panel. And yes. as we move forward, if there are any more audience questions, please type them in the Q&A. And I will try to type the answers or we'll try to get them live. Okay. Sounds good, Melissa. And we encourage our roundtable members that are uh, participating and listening to please also uh, uh, engage. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to go down the list. I'm going to pick one because it was brought up in Dr. Zink in your presentation uh, when it came to um, to enhance vaccination, the use of uh, fuel or cash. So incentives, right? So you know, here in the United States, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have a healthcare system that definitely uh, rewards disease, uh, and we don't uh, do enough upfront for public health and for prevention. We know that, um, but given that context, uh, and uh, I know I've, I called out Dr. Zink, but this is open to everyone. What, what do you guys think about using monetary incentives to really get folks to get vaccinated? Um, why does that feel kind of uh, strange or odd uh, to many of us when in fact, uh, in see, it seems to me, uh, what's the difference of, um, of, you know, we can do it at the, at the back end or how about we do it up front? But uh, what, what are the thoughts uh, from, from you? Because you guys are so close to community. I can kick it off with a few thoughts. You know, I think that the first thing is making sure that people have confidence in the vaccine. I think we've talked a lot about that. And I think that that's key. You know, Antonio's presentation was great in talking about getting vaccine to people at their job site. I think that we have not done enough to uh, involve industry partners in this. You know, flew out on Alaska and was vaccinating seafood fishermen on vessels, um, but they live on those vessels for eight months out of the year and their only opportunity to get vaccinated is there. Most of those people don't speak English from all around the world, uh, and that is their only opportunity. So I think that we need to involve industry much more often and make it super easy so that they're not paying for vaccine by paying out of either their free time or their work time to get vaccine. I think then second to that is finding ways to be able to kind of reward uh, vaccines in different ways. Many of our, particularly our native communities have said, if you're gonna travel into 
to Anchorage, you've got to quarantine when you come back. But if you're vaccinated, you don't need to. And so that is also a way to pay people uh, for the benefit of vaccines. So I think that we really do have to tie those things looking together. Um, and then there was an interesting poll that just came out and put it in the chat box. It was just out this morning talking about the impact of uh, vaccine um, on uh, incentives um, on people uh, overall. We saw, you know, Ohio yesterday announced, you know, million dollar lotteries and what that looks like. Uh, we've done this in other public health measures. We've done this with HIV. We've done it. I mean, we use little cards all the time for TB and syphilis. We pay for health care um, and we also pay for housing so that people who have active TB um, aren't spreading it to other areas. So I don't think this is new to this, um, but I think we need to cautiously and mindfully look at it. So it also isn't that we're bribing people to do it or we're not coercing people. And I think that that is the real balance that we have to be balancing uh, moving those directions. So just a few thoughts and I'll post that one in the chat box. Thanks. Would anyone else like to weigh in? I think, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Go ahead, Dr. Dr. Jim. Okay, no, no. so I think that is also worth um, maybe employers considering um, time off for vaccinations because that's really going to be key to getting their employees vaccinated. So often when I try to get people um, vaccinated, even when we go into the homeless community, I had one patient, he said, I drive a truck. If I feel poorly, that's going to severely compromise um, my, how I'm able to do my job, how I'm able to get myself out of this situation. So we have to really um, talk to employers about making that making that something that that they do that they actually say hey we'll give you eight hours you know off or we'll figure out a way to factor that into pay time off um if you if you get vaccinated that would i think that would go a very long way as far as incentivizing vaccines yeah you know and find? get the mobile get the mobile units out in the parking lots i mean for yep. fortune yep. 500 companies fortune one like think about walmart but if Walmart yep. for their associates got the mobile vaccine unit out in the parking lot and every shift started vaccinating, I mean, that's the way it's got to be done. Yeah. Or as Mr. Tavar, uh, Dr. Tavar brought up uh, where we're actually employers, uh, which was one of our other questions is actually moving forth, especially with those working out in the field. What, I'm, what, I, what I find interesting and what's connecting this for me as each of you are sharing this is actually you're addressing the structural barriers. So, you know, we talk about hesitancy, which in, in my opinion, unfortunately seems to put the onus on the individual. So is it really hesitancy that we're, that we're seeing or in fact are structural barriers really having an impact uh, on folks' decision and, and opportunity to be able to access the vaccine? Because to me, those are really two very key important, important aspects. Uh, it, so I'd like to, to see what, what folks' thoughts are uh, 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 about hesitancy. I, is that what's really happening or is it what we're talking about here that you guys have really highlighted in each of the communities that you have really been able to express so so robustly for us? I can I can speak to that, Octavio. So, so actually, even before the uh, COVID-19 vaccine became readily available in the state of Illinois, um, we actually conducted a survey of our own communities just to see what people um, what were their thoughts on the vaccine? And, and uh, most people were ready to get vaccinated, 70% at that point in December. I mean, now I would argue that the rates are even higher, but even in December, when we knew very little about the vaccine, when it was when they weren't readily available to folks who we were basically just basing our opinion on clinical trials and not on real populations, most people were ready to get vaccinated. And I think it's because in our communities, in the Latino community, COVID has been devastating and people are ready to stop this, right? Um, but what people brought up time and time and again were concerns about documentation, about is it gonna cost me? What's gonna happen if I have to take time off? And in these, it, it, to speak to what you're just saying, structural barriers are real and they continue to be uh, present today. Um, and a lot of the, again, well-intentioned uh, uh, programs that exist for vaccination right now are not addressing those barriers. The, the mass vaccination sites, the pharmacies uh, uh, providing vaccines, those are not addressing those structural barriers. The mobile vaccine sites, they're great, um, but they're not sustainable. And I think that there's one, one issue that we need to think about is that COVID-19 is the current pandemic that we're dealing with right now, but there's structural barriers that we need to think about how to address in the long term. And, um, and again, this, this idea of just 
plopping a vaccine site on a weekend and getting a bunch of people vaccinated are great short-term solutions, but we really need to be thinking about eliminating structural barriers in the long term so that we can keep our communities healthy. Well said. I guess I would just add Dr. that, Zink, you know, yeah. yeah, just with a comment of making sure this is long term and sustainable, thinking about other ways that we already have uh, partners built into the system and advocating for that. So it's great to see Dr. Jobs like mobile vans and uh, fantastic. We ended up really using EMS uh, because they really moved to those communities. So like in the Kenai Peninsula, anyone who's got more than three people who want to be vaccinated, EMS just goes out and does it. And they pick it up from clinics at the end of the day so that they don't waste vaccine and move around. So it's one example. I loved kind of the five Ps uh, and that was physicians, pharmacists, pastors, parents, and peers as kind of the messengers. And I think we need to involve them much more. And then the other big area that I think is really the front line of public health that we don't oftentimes include is schools. Um, many people know who the principal is. Many people know who, you know, their teacher is, but they don't know who the public health official is. Many people don't have a doctor. 25% of Americans don't have a primary care doctor, but many have kids and go to schools. And those are our busy working families uh, that need to make sure that we're supporting their mental health, their physical health, their vaccine health, and what ways we can really be, you know, using things like the ELC grants and funding coming in for testing and vaccine to not just do that, but really build up the health and well-being of our families. People live in communities. They live in families. They don't live in tiers uh, and they don't live in uh, individual kind of like these artificial groupings that we put them in. And so how can we support people? as whole people with the systems that we have in place. And that's really important for the comment that's in the chat um, or the Q&A around these structures that we're addressing and these approaches. We can't just do this for COVID and COVID vaccine. We actually have to move forward with our integration of public health approaches and these specific approaches of addressing structural racism and barriers as we move forward in healthcare delivery. And I think Dr. Abdul Mutakavir, you want to say yes. something? Go ahead, so, um, please. This is something that we've really, really, really been thinking about at Loma Linda. And we really, so I know it's, it's, it's you, of course, it's not super sustainable to have, you know, these, these pop-up clinics and all of this, but I've been kind of thinking of how do I make this sustainable? How do we make this sustainable? Because you, we are going to have to get another dose of this COVID-19 vaccine, likely. We are, but not only that, individuals that of, or minoritized individuals are more likely to die from pneumococcal disease, they're more likely to die from influenza, from influenza. They're, mo they're more likely to contract HIV. So how do we continue to use these platforms that we develop to give education on these other disease states and then create these community vaccination clinics? Because we do, we have seen that actually going into these communities and vaccinating is our key to success to getting these individuals vaccinated. So how do we continue to do this effort? So what we've done is to start using these faith summits as an opportunity to give information on other disease states. So yeah, we will talk about COVID-19, but you all know with how these mRNA vaccines work. So let's start talking about the influenza vaccines. Let's talk about how those works. Let's talk about how the pneumococcal vaccines work. Let's talk about HIV and how that works and how it affects these communities. So now when we have individuals at these, um, at these clinics wait for the 15 minutes, we have an LVN that works in the HIV clinic and he gives out information about HIV. So now we kind of have the two birds, one stone. So, and then hopefully we'll be able to set up um, stations where, we, where we'll be able to do HIV testing. And then we'll be able to have other clinics that are separated by 14 days where we'll be able to you know, start um, vaccinating for other disease states. But I also think the biggest key to our success in making this sustainable is the involvement of students because that the professional students, so we have pharmacy students, uh, physician students, we have nursing students, dental students, <laughs> respiratory therapists, because now everybody can vaccinate for this effort. But they're our future and we want them to be equity minded. That's important. So we, you know, we'll be here for whatever time, you know, that whoever you believe in up above keeps us on this planet. However, these students will live on and these and, and equity will live on through who it is that we train behind us. So we've really been working hard to integrate professional students into this experience for one, sustainability, but for two, to create more empathetic and equity minded practitioners. Thank you. Mr. Sams, um, you know, how has this effort to vaccinate um, uh, COVID, with COVID vaccine, how has it been parallel to the flu vaccination yearly um, in your experience? 
Well, our flu vaccinations have actually done pretty well over the years. Um, and I think because of that historical context of understanding what happened in 1918, um, our, our elders are very clear, similar to what happened in Alaska, talking about um, how that affected us here. When we go up to uh, our local graveyards, we have three of them within walking distance of the community, you can see the number of children who passed because of the flu in 1918 and the elders that were greatly affected. And again, it was families who had um, moved into more isolation within the reservation uh, and similar stories of moving into the mountains. Uh, my grandparents talked about them being taken and living in the mountains uh, and rather than staying in the lowlands for the winter, actually staying in the mountains for that winter uh, in order to ensure isolation. So I think those stories, uh, uh, that intergenerational discussion uh, and using of uh, traditional oral tradition has helped maintain and encourage people to get those uh, vaccinations. Um, this year, of course, we saw because people were wearing masks, we didn't have very many people reporting with the flu um, and because people continue to be isolated. So uh, we demonstrates once again, when that season comes around, vaccination is important and some form of isolation or at least mask wearing. So I, I foresee that being a trend for us in the future. To build on one thing that Charles just said that I really appreciate, and that's the importance of oral tradition. I think it's one thing for public health officials to be able to put like put together a lot of pamphlets in different languages, and that's very, very different than having oral stories be told in oral language. And I think that many cultures have really based themselves on oral storytelling for a long time, and we need to put more emphasis and time on that to be able to communicate appropriately. Thanks. Um, I think uh, there is a question in, in the audience around incarcerated individuals. Um, I, mean, I know we didn't touch base. Does any panelists want to um, briefly touch base on uh, work being done to serve incarcerated individuals and their families through the pandemic, or at least some uh, reference or resource that we can refer our audience members to? I'm happy to jump in, you know, as a state, that was a big focus of our work from the day one. Um, and when we started to meet back in January, when we were seeing these cases, Department of Corrections was at the table with us at every single step. Most Department of Corrections do have like an influenza plan to be able to figure out what that looks like and how to uh, be able to minimize infectious disease. Um, but just like our communities, they needed different resources. They needed testing. They knew that they were at higher risk for having cases and outbreaks and what that looked like. Um, we really quickly saw that if we were able to identify cases in congregate settings very, very quickly, it was a game changer. So we started to move to Abbott Now and Binext Now cards rather than PCR testing, because if you could move someone that day rather than waiting a couple days, that was huge. So we ended up prioritizing our most rapid resources to our rural villages or our incarcerated individuals to be able to move forward. We put a big emphasis on partnering with incarcerated individuals to mitigating disease, and they ended up getting a ton of uh, sewing machines and making masks at the very beginning. In fact, they made so many masks uh, that uh, we had a lot, and they started to help with other state employees, um, and there was a lot of education from day one on what that looked like. Um, we saw some significant outbreaks uh, in some of our incarcerated, in our some of our facilities, uh, some much less so. I uh, started uh, surveillance testing really, really early on with that population. Uh, Alaska does about three times as much testing as the United States as a whole uh, for COVID and a lot of that was surveillance testing because we knew that once we got cases, we weren't going to be able to do much because either people were incarcerated, we had limited healthcare infrastructure and resources. We know in public health that prevention works and we know that people change behavior if they know their disease, if they know, if they have that empowered that information. And so testing was critical in that. And that really empowered uh, you know, incarcerated individuals to know what that looks like. Vaccines uh, were then a huge uh, challenge. Um, we started to vaccinate really early on. You know, As Charles was just describing, uh, our tribes were critical in this. So they very quickly on uh, partnered with us to be able to vaccinate the entire prison system very quickly with some of their Salva Nation supplement uh, vaccine. So we partnered with their vaccine. Um, and then we really tried to get uh, the rep a group of vaccineers going into the clinic uh, and into the DOCs that was culturally representative. So people would have faith and trust and really importance of not vaccinating some people and not others, but really making it accessible and really trying to not marginalize some groups of people early on and then opening up visitation very quickly. So it's been, it's been a challenge for sure um, in being able to minimize, minimize disease spread, uh, but it is critically important uh, that we identify early uh, and we recognize it. The other thing I would say is that our Department of Corrections talks about all the time that corrections is, um, is just another part of your village <laughs> and it isn't something off on an island by itself and our correction facilities that had the most cases were in communities that had the most cases and so we had to protect the health and well-being of the community to also protect the other people in our community including those who were incarcerated at that time and there's it's not a totally walled off system there's you know employees that go back and forth there's visitation that goes back and forth and I think too many times we silo off corrections as its own kind of island that isn't connected to the community but they are part of our community and those are our community
community members. And so we really need to address it collectively. And it's back to you, Kat, because we're out of time. But whoa, thank you all. Go, Kat, it's yours. Thank you. And thank you for, for offering such thoughtful questions. Um, we are out of time, but I want to thank everyone for attending today. And our next webinar, it's not scheduled yet, but our next webinar will focus on the unique ways that the Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities are being affected by the COVID pandemic. Just as a reminder, the website will be, excuse me, the recording of this webinar will be on the Roundtable's website probably next week. And I thank everyone for attending. Bye. Thank you, everyone. You guys were fabulous. Thank you, Melissa. Bye, Kat. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.